Hi, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where in the country or the world you're in. I'm Alexandra Katahakis, and I'm the founder and clinical director of the Center for Healthy Sex in Los Angeles. And I want to welcome you to our monthly webinar series, From Mirror of Intimacy, which is a book on uh, emotional and erotic intelligence. So I want to encourage you to ask questions as I go along in this webinar today and to share your thoughts in the comments section. And if you'd like to ask a question anonymously, feel free to email charlie at centerforhealthysex.com. So that's one uh, word, centerforhealthysex.com, and charlie at centerforhealthysex.com. And then Charlie will um, text the questions over to me. So. Uh, you don't have to feel like uh, your uh, confidentiality or your, um, you know, who you are is being revealed in any way. So during the first part of this webinar, <clears throat> I want you to think about the question, what in my life, whether it's with work or family, love or sex, is not in balance? So our topic today is equilibrium. And of course, equilibrium is about finding that place of balance. And equilibrium implies uh, a fluid um, sort of oscillating state, if I were to demonstrate it. It doesn't mean that it's static or you're there because um, I think that's a fallacy that we get into thinking that we find balance when really balance and equilibrium are negotiations. So what in your life, whether it's work, family, sex, love, um, any other kind of relationships, if you are unfortunately, you know, struggling with the aftermath of some of the recent hurricanes, then you're going to have a lot of disequilibrium in your life. So think about that too. That's really a situation where your life perhaps has been upended. But even in the upending, the challenge and the call is to seek moments of equilibrium, moments of balance. So I'm going to ask you to kind of meditate on that question as we go along here. Our quote from today is from Gladys Avery, and she says, equilibrium is not only the state in which opposing forces are balanced, but also the calmness of our minds, our being, where we can take full control of our lives and still appear calm in the midst of adversity. So let's break that down then. Equilibrium is not only the state in which opposing forces are balanced. So you can have a poor, opposing forces in your life. Um, that are out of balance. So for example, you might have a child who's um, arguing or unhappy about your partner, or you may have a um, work situation where somebody doesn't like somebody else, or the company itself is um, struggling in one way, but the employees are happy. Um, so there's there's a an out of balance within something. So it's the state of those opposing forces. But it's the calmness of our minds, our very, very sense of being, where we can take control of our lives. So even if you are a victim of one of these horrible hurricanes and you have the opposing forces of you know, your life and your families and trying to stay positive and the forces of nature, somewhere in the midst of that, and I know it's easier said than done, our challenge is to find peace in our minds, calmness in our mind. And whether you do that through prayer, meditation, contemplation, or daily mindfulness practice to remind you that right here and right now in this moment, everything is a-okay. Being able to maintain that calmness in the face of adversity allows for equilibrium. So you may be struggling with many, many things, but staying calm helps you to get into solutions also, to find out and figure out, sometimes with other trusted people, where you go from now and what you should do next. <clears throat> and this is about the artful balance of opposites. And equilibrium is just about that, the artful balancing of these opposites whose results is, are both mental, emotional, and spiritual. So having poise in your life. And this touches all aspects of our identity from gender expression to the roles we play in our relationships. Because for many people as children, we can perceive ourselves in these very stark polarities, meaning we think of ourselves as all good or all bad, 
um, because we've been told that in one way or the other. And these polarities can lead us to believe that we have to choose a narrow interpretation of ourself. And that fits into a, you know, fits into an easy, singular, checked off box. And so if someone told you that certain parts of you were wrong or bad, and you felt shameful about it, you likely compartmentalized a whole bunch of other aspects of yourself. Um, and so you perceive yourself in one way. And society can also um, do this to children too. I mean, the best example that comes to my mind are people who are gay. Um, if they're told they're bad or their sexuality is wrong or it's dirty or it's blasphemous or any other um, sort of atrocity, then those very people are going to shut down all the other glimmering parts of themselves, their intelligence, their beauty, their strength, their possibility and potential, uh, because they're left to feel so bad about themselves. Those people who struggle with addiction are often emotionally abused, much more than physically or sexually abused. So when that happens, a child will start to compartmentalize these very parts of themselves. Parts of themselves disappear to them or they become um, sequestered from themselves and they don't know other aspects of themselves which leave them feeling one dimensional and oftentimes in a lot of pain, which is where drugs and alcohol can come into play as analgesics for the pain. So if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to text them in the text box to me. Um, I see a number of you have joined, uh, but I don't see any questions yet. So feel free to uh, type them into this box here and maybe I'll send you a little note right now so you know that I'm here. Okay. So that leaves us in a paradox of thinking, is it one thing or another thing? And we might have grown comfortable with our femininity, for example, but shrunk from the more masculine elements of our personality. Or we, maybe we embraced our athleticism while quietly disavowing our intellectual activities. And I know for myself, because I grew up in a household with uh, parents, one of whom was an immigrant, one of whom had assimilated, she was first generation, um, I was really more uh, taught to privilege the feminine aspect of myself and those parts of myself that were considered more masculine, such as being ambitious or competitive, were not privileged or championed in any way, shape or form. And so that left me with an imbalance in who I was. I didn't know about that part of my potential and I didn't really learn about it until later in my life, really well into my 30s. And so that was a deficit um, that occurred not because my parents were cruel, they were just insensitive. And they were also from a particular generation where there were ascribed gender roles. And what that did was disavow a particular part um, of me that I later had to come to on my own. So somebody writes, uh, my boyfriend gives me the silent treatment. What can I do? Um, what's the best response? And um, that, um, th that's sort of an interesting thing because when we talk about equilibrium, um, I would say that he is clearly upset, hurt, or angry about something, and he can't, he's not unable to hold on to his love for you and his care for you and his reason for being in the relationship with his upset. And that's a great example of equilibrium, is being able to hold the tension of those polarities. So he clearly struggles with confrontation and being able to be honest and authentic in the moment with you. So there's not a whole lot that we can do when somebody's not speaking to us. Um, I personally find that incredibly um, difficult to work with. It leaves me feeling abandoned, lost, um, unsure about the relationship. It can also uh, leave anyone starting to think about breaking up, divorce, because we start to project all sorts of things onto that person because we don't know what's going on. So if he's your boyfriend, I'm going to ask uh, before I assume that you're not living with him. If you're not living with him, that certainly makes it a lot easier. Um, if you're not living with him, I would suggest that you not reach out to him, that you don't text or call or email. Um, you, you do let him know, of course, that um, it appears that you need some space 
And when you're ready to talk to me again, let me know, but I'm not going to bother you. I want to respect your need for space. And then you have to go away and really soothe your own anxieties. Um, do some writing about what you need in this relationship. What effect does the silent treatment have on you? How does it activate your own attachment wounds and injuries from your own childhood? And is this the kind of person that you want to be in relationship with? Um, you write <clears throat> that you were, uh, somebody writes that they were silenced by their parents as a child, particularly your mother. Um, and so if that is the case, um, then that's another form of what I've been talking about, which is um, sort of eradicating a very specific part of you. So I would ask you what part of you was silenced? Um, what part of you was shut down? And maybe you don't know the answer to that cognitively. It's something that will, um, you know, require deeper exploration and therapy. Uh, but it sounds like, from what you're saying, Oliver, that you, when you say you were um, admonished over time, um, that that is long-term, chronic, unprincipled shaming, essentially, by silencing a child. So the challenge is for you to figure out what parts of me were silenced. If you could float back to that time you were a child before the chronic admonishment started, and of course you may not remember a time when that didn't exist, but think about that or maybe look at photos of yourself as a child and look at that child's eyes and ask yourself if that child could have <clears throat> metaphorically flown, if he could have played in any way he wanted to or expressed himself in any way, what would he have been doing? Would he have been pretending to be a rodeo cowboy or a fighter pilot um, or a ballet dancer? What was the thing that he most wanted? What kind of voice would he have had? <clears throat> so you could start to see what was stolen from you, what was taken away from you. And with that, you can start to focus on what of myself do I want to begin to reclaim? How do I want to start taking back that which was <clears throat> taken from me? Uh, so you write a rock singer. So it may be really good for you to consider going to the School of Rock, which is here in Los Angeles. And I know they have summer camps. Um, and or, or getting a guitar if you don't already have one and giving it your absolute best, most awkward shot um, to let yourself feel what it feels like to be that rock singer, to reclaim your voice, to reclaim that part of you that wants to, you know, wildly express uh, without care about who and what people think about you. Um, that would be a great way for you to um, start to take back that part of your voice that was stolen from you. Um, the person who was writing before about the, her boyfriend says, we do live together. Do I handle my response differently um, in the silent treatment? Well, I would say, you know, similarly, you should let your partner know that you're not going to be chasing him, that you're not going to, um, you know, chase after him to make him talk to you, um, and that you should make your own plans during the week and find ways to soothe yourself and his presence. And if it's horribly tense and uncomfortable, then you may want to consider staying in a friend's house for a couple days um, and let him figure out what he needs to do because this is a passive aggressive move, the silent treatment. Um, the person who's engaging in the silent treatment is responsible for making the other person or letting the other person know that they are um, not upset any longer because clearly he's telegraphing that he's upset. And if he never comes towards you, if he doesn't break the silence or make any overtures towards talking to you, then you really need to consider why you're in relationship with someone like this and why you would tolerate that because this won't go away. It will continue on as long as you're together if he doesn't do something about it, namely get into therapy and figure out why he does what he does. Um, and you'll be living with this the rest of your life. And those silent treatments will go on for weeks. You know, I've heard of people living in this kind of torture sometimes for a month, for a month, on, for a month on end. The other person tolerating that. Um, and I think that kind of tension is as vicious as somebody who, you know, rages. At least with the rager, you know what's going on. 
So to continue with this slide, it says with honest reflection and exploration, we can learn to embrace vast, varied, and evolving palettes of traits that paints our self-image expansively and fully. And so that's what I was talking to Oliver about, um, is that he's saying, okay, I wanted to be a rock singer as a child, and I was admonished and maybe made fun of or maybe shamed. I don't know what exactly. And so now it would be really challenging, perhaps, to say, I'm going to go learn to play the electric guitar. Um, I'm going to go do something that's really outrageous, um, and I'm going to go learn to sing rock if I haven't already, and I'm going to put it all together and take lessons and maybe form a band on the weekends so that I can, um, you know, rage from the top of the rafters and reclaim that part of myself because there's a vitality in that. There's an aliveness in that that also connects to the body and connects to our sexuality. So how do you practice equilibrium um, in this case? We're talking obviously about, you know, love and sexuality and relationships. And just like individuals, healthy relationships or any systems thrive on balance. And without balance, we are disequilibriated. Um, if you see a plant whose leaves are yellow, there's a disequilibrium in the soil there. There's a lacking of nurturing um, or nutrients, whether it's water, air, sunshine, you name it, um, or food. So practicing equilibrium with a sexual partner um, can feel harrowing at times, and it can be a wonderful adventure. So once, uh, when we start to risk um, inhabiting new mindsets and behaviors and emotions, we start to feel this adventure. So in both of these situations of the people that have written in, um, whether it's a relationship or um, it's something that happened in the past with the parent, when we start to take these things on, when we say, no, I'm not going to live with this because this is a limitation, or it feels like I'm being hurt in some way, or I'm tolerating living with only a fraction of myself, and I really need all of myself in the picture, it's going to feel challenging. It will feel challenging for this woman to say to her boyfriend, I'm leaving the house until you're ready to talk because it's inconvenient and it brings up fear. And like, maybe this person won't want to be with us again, or worse yet, maybe we'll find out we don't want to be with the person. And so we have to get honest with ourselves. Um, or I'm going to go take lessons with something and I'm going to be the oldest person in the class or I'm going to have the most terrible voice or I don't have the guitar skills. And all of those things are uncomfortable. They really are uncomfortable and can feel harrowing. Likewise, this kind of conversation with the sexual partner can feel harrowing and uncomfortable. But when we take that sort of risk, we're challenging ourselves to grow, not just our partners, but ourselves to have new mindsets, to try new behaviors, to deal with and feel and tolerate the emotions that come with that as well. And that is how we stretch and grow, not through reading books necessarily, but by actually taking action and moving ourselves out into the world. If we're used to our partner initiating physical intimacy, for example, what would it feel like to change for ourselves? What would it feel like if you initiated this time instead of waiting for he or she to initiate? Why don't you initiate? Why do you take a passive position? What does that mean for you to be passive and wait for the other to come towards you? And how much deprivation is in that? Um, that you sit around waiting for scraps or whatever someone brings you. You don't ever get to ask yourself, what do I really want? And what am I going to do to take charge of getting what I want? Um, these are essential questions to ask ourselves for growth and change and to create this equilibrium in our lives. Creating balance between leading and following can strengthen and nurture a blossoming bond. So with that, if you are used to initiating or you're used to receiving, why not go to your partner and say, I'd like to change that. I'd like to try just for a week or two where you initiate this time or I initiate uh, for this period of time and you be the recipient and I be the initiator or I'm going to be the recipient and you be the initiator. And are you willing to change this? And can we both 
have compassion for ourselves about feeling awkward and kindness and compassion for the other because the other is trying their best. Oftentimes what happens is both people's anxiety goes up and they end up blaming and shaming each other out of their frustration. So if, for example, um, you're somebody who initiates all the time and you're asking your partner to do that and your partner's really uncomfortable with that for a whole host of reasons, but they say, okay, I'm gonna try that this week. And they come to you in a way that seems awkward or sheepish or tentative, rather than getting frustrated, which is really angry, or rolling your eyes or making some joke or snide remark about it, how do you manage your own anxiety and stay open hearted and praise the person for trying that saying, wow, I really appreciate that. Or it's okay that it's uncomfortable for you. I love you for trying this. Or it's okay, we'll get through this together. How do you meet that person in their discomfort as opposed to raising the bar and saying, if you can't do it like this, I don't want you to do it, which becomes again, a form of emotional shaming. So when we're more at ease, um, if we're more at ease at giving pleasure, we can practice opening ourselves up to being the receiving party and may discover that we don't always have to be the one in control. So remember the receiving position is always the more vulnerable position and the controlling position is always the giving position. So we all love to give gifts, to give things, to give whatever, uh, because we're in control of how that's done. But receiving means that we have to tolerate that oh, I wouldn't have exactly done it that way, or I wish it was more this way or that way. And that those kind of judgments create separation from our partners and from ourselves. So put your judgments aside, make yourself vulnerable, let yourself receive and see what that feels like. I think about equilibrium as a form of empowerment also that's coming from within. So in the same way that uh, you might spin a top effortlessly um, and that changes direction without tipping over. Equilibrium ensures spontaneity and a variation in our sex lives. So think about that when you are constantly playing with the polarities of this tension of the balance that you're trying to get into balance, that creates novelty in the system. And there's a spontaneity in that because you never know what piece is going to go where, what's going to happen. And that allows for variation in your sex life, for change, for new ideas and new things. And with that, we become empowered to stretch beyond our perceived limits. So if, for example, Oliver um, does decide that he's going to um, uh, practice being a rock star, um, and that uh, he is going to, um, you know, be compassionate, um, then there's going to be um, a stretch and a change beyond these perceived limitations of having been admonished for so long. Uh, um, and so that is the value in it. It's not just about showing the other person saying, I'm going to show you, I'm going to do this anyway, which can be rebellious and sometimes reckless. No, it's about, ah, uh, you told me I couldn't do this. I believed I couldn't do it. I'm going to try it for my very own self to see what I'm made of, to see if I'm capable of doing this, because there's no greater satisfaction than that. So stretch beyond your perceived limitations today and see um, who you are and admit to yourself that, wow, you have many, many more capacities than you may think you have only because somebody else told you you didn't have them. And it's not a good idea to believe other people. It's a better idea to go find out for yourself. So does anybody have any questions at this juncture? Remember, you can type them in uh, to charlie at centerforhealthysex.com. Um, also, if you have any questions, please feel free to call our intake counselors. They're standing by. If you have any questions about sex or love addiction or resources you need, you can call 310-843-9902. And we are on the West Coast in Los Angeles. 
Um, so Paul writes in and he says, uh, somehow in this notion of equilibrium, I end up with a sensation um, of brakes and accelerator in equal measure. That's a great um, example, I think, resulting in fear, shame, paralysis, which is definitely a problem. Um, and so when you think about um, holding both polarities, that is a go, a go and a stop, which is what you're talking about. There are the brakes and the accelerator at the same time. Um, and then you start to freeze. It's what it sounds like so that you get into this paralysis. Um, and that freeze state can be uh, problematic because um, obviously you can't budge from that. So before you start to make a move, Paul, I would suggest that you do some writing about this, about what I was talking about earlier, if you were to look at yourself as a child and what parts of you were silenced um, or cordoned off, compartmentalized, shut down, however you think about it, um, and make a list of what those things are. And then maybe in the next column, ask yourself, what do I need to do to overcome that? So for me, for example, if we go back to the idea of feminine being privileged over traditionally masculine, like women, well, at the time it was girls don't do that and women don't do that. Um, and so one of them is being ambitious means that you're acting too much like a male. Um, so if that were a real time problem for me today, I would write that down and then I would ask myself, what is the thing I want to do that feels too ambitious, that feels like I'm out of my league? I would write that thing down. I don't know what that would be because I've been able to overcome that myth um, for quite some time now. So I, I guess as I'm talking about it and thinking about it now, I remember when I was thinking about writing Erotic Intelligence, which was in the 2000s, um, and I had a therapist at the time who said, when are you going to start writing? And I remember bursting into tears because internally I felt like I couldn't do that. Like I wasn't capable of doing it. And that was a real turning point for me to see, wow, look at all this helplessness, which is really a form of learned helplessness that I have. Nobody's saying you can't write. Um, I did, you know, have a college education and a master's degree at that time. So clearly I was able to write something along the way besides a grocery list, right? So I could actually write. And yet there was this voice in my head that I wasn't good enough that I couldn't do it. And so I decided to not declare that I was writing a book, but I was just going to sit down. I was going to take a long week. I think I took a week off. Um, you know, for vacation. And during that week, I committed to writing every day. And I committed to writing what the contents of my head were. That's it. I'm just going to write down every single thing I know about sex, love, relationship, and sex addiction, and see what happens and not censor it. And so I did. I got up every morning. I wrote. I would go for long walks. I would come back and write again. Um, I would do some, you know, like stand on my head because I was so frustrated, <laughs> yoga poses and things like that. But I just kept at it. And at the end of that week, I had 80 pages written, 80 pages of raw material I could start to sculpt into a book. And after that, I realized, oh, what I need is to find somebody who's an editor that can help me organize these 80 pages into chapters. And once I had chapters, I had a guideline from which to write. So you have to do this in small measures so that you're not overwhelming yourself. But like you, I was frozen in that place and stuck feeling like I can't do this. Um, I'm not going to be able to. So you're saying that that happens to you. So I would challenge you um, to take that leap, whatever it is and whoever you are that's listening to this, and to say, um, I'm just going to do the one thing I can do today. So the question is, what are the list of things you're afraid of, what you would call the breaks? What are the things I want to do, which you would call the accelerator? And then what one thing can I do to move towards that thing? And the, the another column would be, what thing is in my way? Is there any obstacle in my way? And the obstacle I had was I didn't have the time. And that's when I decided to look at my calendar and say, okay, I'm going to take time off. And rather than go on vacation or stay at home and clean out closets, I'm actually going to commit to this thing. And I'm going to do it every day, no matter how painful it is, and see what happens. 
And that goes back to one of the things I said earlier, this notion of having to tolerate discomfort in order to find this equilibrium. It felt harrowing to me. Um, somebody emailed in and said, how should I start a conversation with my husband who might not be open to change? Well, I think that's interesting, this idea about who's open to change and who isn't open to change. Um, human beings thrive on change and we also can't stand change. Um, we are creatures of habit. Um, we just love our own little bubbles that we're in. And I think you start the conversation by talking about yourself and what's missing for you without blaming or shaming him. Um, and so I don't know what the nature of your relationship is or how you negotiate these things, but I might ask um, my partner to make some time. Can we sit down and talk? Because there's some things I want to talk to you about myself, not that horrible feeling of, you know, we need to talk. It can't be that. It's got to be, I've, I've been thinking about some things for myself that I want to run by you. Or let's go for a walk because I want to talk about some things. Um, I prefer face-to-face -face interaction. So no television, no phones, no distractions, but a real eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball conversation. And I think you have to be clear about what changes you want to make for yourself. And whether or not he wants to get on board with that is not really the issue. So... For example, if you decide that you want to, I don't know, learn to play the piano um, and that you're going to find a inexpensive upright piano and that you're going to buy it and that you're going to put it into a certain room in the house or in the garage and that you're also going to start taking piano lessons, um, this might not be the best example and that, you know, you want him to do that with you, which is probably not likely. Um, maybe it's something bigger. Maybe it's that you want to move or that you want to travel. Um, but let's stick with the piano metaphor. My point is, is that you want to let him know that this is what you want to do. It's your heart's desire that you want it to happen and that you're going to make measures to make it happen. And then how does he feel about that? Because you're not asking him to shop for the piano, buy the piano, go to the lessons, pay for the lessons. You're organizing that yourself. It's for you. Now, if you're talking about moving, which is buying a house or traveling, then it's a little bit of a different conversation. With traveling, you have to let him know how important that is to you and that if he doesn't want to do it, you understand, but that you're going to start scheduling long weekends or a week away here and there, and you're likely either going to travel by yourself if you enjoy that, or you're going to start asking a friend to go with you and what's that going to be like for him and how are you going to work that out in your family. The point here is that you are having a conversation and you know, words aren't lethal. If your partner doesn't like it or they're angry or they're upset because you're upsetting the apple cart, it's okay. Um, you, you don't have to be responsible for other person's um, comfort or equilibrium all the time because that doesn't allow for a person or a system to grow and change. Systems change when there's heat in them. Otherwise, they stay the same and you shouldn't have to sacrifice your potential um, or your own life, because we each only get one life um, of the things you want to do because you have to play it safe with someone else. Now, there's a lot in what I just said, and it can be easily misconstrued as sounding selfish or that when you're in a relationship or a marriage, you don't have to consider the other person. And what I'm saying is not that. What I'm talking about is differentiation. The ability to hold on to yourself, to take your own shape, to be your own person in close proximity to someone that you love. And by you doing that, it forces the other person to change or not. That's their choice, though. You're not imposing it on them. You're just moving ahead with your life. You're not saying you have to do this, or if you don't do this, I'm leaving you, or you're a cheapskate because you won't do it. No, you're just making plans for your life um, while the two of you are in a life together. So challenge yourself to stretch beyond these perceived limits, limits um, and admit things to yourself that you are tolerating. Um, and notice, as somebody writes, that heat implies the transfer of energy. And that's absolutely true. Without heat, 
in the system, whether you are exercising, if you're on a treadmill, we all see people like this. I hope you're not one of those people. I'm not one of those people that walk on the treadmill in the gym at, you know, two miles an hour and they're on their phones or reading a book and they're actually not doing a whole lot because there's no heat in that that system. Now, of course, it's good to move. It's good to walk. We all know that. But if you really want to burn calories, if you want to increase your cardiovascular capacity, you've got to get some heat going in that system. It's not comfortable. It's sweaty. It's hard or it's difficult. But in the end, you're expanding capacity. And we have to be able, as Oliver says, to hold a space for ourselves and for the other simultaneously. Okay, so when we think about daily sex acts and daily healthy sex acts as equilibrium, I want you to take a moment right now to imagine perfect equilibrium between your inner and outer reality. So what you actually want and what the reality of your situation is. So this is kind of sinking um, our capacity for um, imagination with the hard reality of what's in front of us. Um, also, we could say your feminine and masculine energies are in balance and in peace with each other. And when you think about that perfect equilibrium between your inner and outer reality, I'm curious about what, if anything, comes up to you, if you could send a note about that. Somebody just wrote good. <laughs> okay, it's good. So I'll tell you something I've been grappling with lately is this notion of gratitude because we all talk about gratitude all the time. And I've noticed that I've always had gratitude, but there's always a yes, but in that. I'm grateful, but yeah, I wish I had more of this, that, or the other thing. And with that, I have been missing terribly, terribly um, the absolute riches I have around me. And I don't mean piles of gold or money, but the richness of the comforts that I have. And with the advent of these recent natural disasters and also the atrocities that we've seen in our country with racism um, and being patently unsafe in the world, I've started to really feel a very big difference between my inner and outer reality. My outer reality now is aligning with this inner reality of wanting more. When I open my refrigerator and it's full because I had the money to go to the grocery store and there's this beautiful selection of food in it, my inner reality is starting to say, wow, I have an abundant life. I am so grateful that I can open my refrigerator and have food in it. Or I walk down the street in my neighborhood and it's peaceful. There are no bombs going off. There's nobody assaulting me with a weapon. There's no massive hurricane coming down the street as we just saw in Florida this last week. And these moments of recognition, um, distinct, clear, and present moments start to create an equilibrium for me between my outer reality and my inner reality. So I'm really seeing that which I have instead of being in some fantasy about what I don't have or what I want more of. And that has created much more of an equilibrium, a gratitude, a contentment um, within me. And Paul writes, you know, to trust himself, that when he trusts himself, then it's true. When you trust yourself, you, that is an inner reality. You will manifest trustworthy people um, in your outer reality is also. So it can go both ways where you're shifting your perspective from one reality to another and then holding both of those as the truth. Because if we just um, project our inner reality out into the world, we're often in fantasy. We have this fantasy of how life should be and we're not in reality of what we have. And for those that are hardcore rationalist and realist, um, which we see a lot of in our country today, what that leaves out is empathy and compassion for other human beings. And it, it can be um, very dismissive and downright cruel at times also. So we have to have the balance of caring for both and, inner and outer, ourselves and the other, all at the same time. These are paradoxes and there's complexity to them. It's not just reducing it to one thing or the other. 
So I want you to take a moment now um, to really visualize world peace. And that's a difficult thing to imagine with all the upset in the world. But if you visualize world peace, uh, the do-gooders, the wrongdoers, the progressives, the conservatives, women and men, all the polarities in this world at peace just for one moment. Notice the feeling that you have in your body, specifically in your chest around your heart. And if every day we can all take a moment, just one single solitary moment like that, to visualize the state of the world in equilibrium, I believe that we can make some headway into shifting it, even if it's just for that one moment. So, one of our um, writers says, I've been single for a long time, so the idea of romantic or sexual equilibrium feels like an impossible goal. Can I have this kind of equilibrium if I'm not in a relationship? And I would say, yes, this is an inside job. It starts with you first. The deepest and the greatest love of all is really with our own selves and not in a narcissistic self-centered way, but in a self-compassionate way. And when you come out of deprivation, when you start to you know, become a rock star in your own mind and you take those classes and you sing and you dance, uh, when you don't let somebody give you the silent treatment and you really start to treat yourself better, then you will begin to have a state of equilibrium inside of you and you'll start to attract people because they'll find that attractive. Those vitality states, those risks that you take, those interesting bits and pieces of yourself that you're reclaiming. Uh, because all of us are sort of a hodgepodge of things that we've done in our lives and how we've cobbled our mental health together um, and made ourselves whole and complete, uh, complete at least for today. Um, let's see, who else do we have? Um, someone says, although I am reasoning that perhaps it is premised uh, on my having problems with boundaries in childhood. Um, I'm not sure what that tracks back to, but um, yes, when we have problems in childhood, as I said, we're going to have and carry those boundary problems into adulthood. And that's what we're talking about is how do we straighten those things out for ourselves? Um, those lead to problems with intimacy, obviously. And that's what we want to clean up first by having intimacy with ourselves. If those self states were cordoned off in some ways, being integrated, making ourselves whole, really loving ourselves so that we are lovable for other people. So other people are attracted to that wholeness. So today, before we wrap this up, I want to challenge you to seek equilibrium in your life, whether it's in your love life or in your life. If you initiate, follow. If you a follower, start to initiate. If you focus on your own pleasure, focus on your partner's pleasure. Switch positions, whatever you've been up to, and energize the other side of yourself. Stop letting that part of yourself, that child part of yourself, um, sit in the corner, dust him or her off, bring him or her out, let him or her have a voice today, um, and practice being all of who you are. So once again, I want to thank you for your participation in this webinar today. To remind you that Mirror of Intimacy is indeed a book. Somebody asked me recently, they didn't know it was a book, which was surprising to me. Um, and you can find the book on Amazon.com and share your reviews anytime. So until next time, meaning in October, um, when I look forward to seeing you again, I hope that you practice holding these polarities, these tensions, and that you create equilibrium in your life so that you can create it in the lives of the people you love and in the world. Thank you.